Father, how good it is for your people to gather in your house that when saints come together, the Spirit of God resides, working powerfully in our midst, working in our hearts to bring those who are saved closer to Christ, drawing out sin that remains inside, helping us see a wonderfully good Savior and Lord, and giving us a greater desire to know our Lord even more. Father, how good it is for a believer to say, oh Lord, I love you, but I want to love you more. I know you, but I want to know you deeper. I'm serving you, but I want to serve you more faithfully. And Lord, how good it is when you bring unbelievers into our midst, either physically here or on the radio or online, somebody who doesn't know you in salvation, who has never experienced the freedom from sin and death, who is enslaved in the darkness of their own hearts, for them to hear the gospel, that Jesus Christ saves, that Jesus, and in Jesus alone, is there redemption from our sins. There's freedom from our sins. We can be made alive in Jesus Christ through the repentance of sins, the turning away, the rejection of the things in our hearts that separate us from you, and a believing, a trusting, and having faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Father, it sounds so simple, and in one way it is. Such a simple message that don't try to earn your salvation, but trust in the grace of Jesus Christ. Believe in Jesus Christ. Accept what he has done for us to take away our sin and to give us life in him. It's a simple message with profound, deep, rich realms of truth. How on earth could me, a sinner, an enemy of God, be loved so much by the one in who I've been at war with, the son of God, the son of David, the son of man, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, to die for my sins? Father, I will never get to a point where I can understand why you would do that for me. Why you would take a sinner who, as Isaiah would say, even the very best of my deeds are filthy rags in your eyes. How you could take me and you could bring me into your family, adopted as a child of God, now an heir to the inheritance of God, all through the work of Jesus Christ, death on the cross, and raising to new life when defeating sin and the resurrection. What a glorious Savior we serve. What a wonderful story of redemption. Father, if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, may this be the day of their salvation. Might this be the day that your spirit breaks through the cold, dark, hard hearts Father, I remember that day for me when you broke through my heart, when you showed me Christ, and he was beautiful. Might that happen today? Father, will you help us in all of the churches here in this area to proclaim the gospel faithfully so that this community might become on fire for the gospel? Father, we desire to see our neighbors know you. We desire to see in our neighbors and in our co-workers, in the kids that we interact with, with our kids, our grandkids, we desire to see all of the people that we interact with to not only profess Jesus, but to live redeemed lives. Father, that happens through the proclamation of your word. Will you help us as a church to do that? The proclamation isn't just behind this pulpit on Sunday mornings, but it's also in the day-to-day -day way that, that we live our lives for believers to speak truth in the midst of hopeless situations. And Father, we know that we're not an island in this endeavor. Your kingdom surpasses the local ministry of First Baptist. And so every week we pray for other churches and we do this because we recognize that we're a part of something bigger than ourselves.
that your spirit is working across Sedalia, across Pettis County, across Missouri, across the United States, and across this world. And so, Father, you have called us to a little slice of that. But we pray for our brothers and sisters all across the world, missionaries, pastors, men and women who are teaching and proclaiming the gospel right now. Will you bless them and give them strength? And churches in our area, oh, Father, will you strengthen them in truth? For Flat Creek Baptist Church, Father, will you work in their midst that whoever's proclaiming the gospel will do so boldly this morning and speak truth for Memorial Baptist Church? Father, will you use them as a bastion for the gospel so that when anyone hearkens through their doors, all they hear is about a redeemer, Jesus Christ. And Father, for Providence Baptist Church, will you bless them with great gospel success that many might hear truth that they might be encouraged in the faith, that they won't be discouraged, but they'll trust in you. Lord, how good it is when your people sing praises to you and proclaim your name to all the nations. Lord, as we worship you this morning, might that happen. Might we fade away into the background and might Christ come into the forefront. Might we see Christ in his beauty. Oh, Lord. Might we love this Savior. Lord, we need you, and we are here because of you to bring you honor, glory, and praise. We pray these things in the resurrected name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Father, I confess that there are many times in my life, I'm especially reminded of 2020 as just a shining example of my need for you. There were days personally and then as I looked out on what was happening in the world where I asked that question, is he worthy? In the great midst of loss, in the midst of seemingly so much taken from me, the question seemed appropriate in the moment of whether you were worthy of my praise because there were admittedly moments where it maybe didn't seem in a midst of darkness like you were. And yet when I went to your word, it tells me the same answer every time. You are. You are worthy. And if that was true then, it's true now, and it's true for all of eternity. So as we open up your word this morning, oh Father, will you help us to have minds and hearts that are open to truth. That though there might be darkness right now and fear and anger and bitterness that has assailed us for so long, it's practically become our identity. Will you break the strongholds of that in our lives so that Christ enters in and we say he is, he is worthy. Lord, will you help us to see that it's all about you. It's all about Christ. Oh, Father, will you send your spirit in our midst now so that you will be glorified and we might hear from God and not from a man. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, isn't it good when worship lifts our thoughts higher to the Lord? That's what we need. Well, we are going through the Marks of a Healthy Church. That is the, um, the sermon series that we are in. And so if you have your Bibles, I would invite you to open them with me to Luke chapter 24, verses 25 to 35. And the title of the sermon this morning is The Marks of a Healthy Church. Again, we're progressively considering what these are. And this, what we're talking about this morning is it's all about God. It's all about God. And let me begin by um, sharing with you something that God has done in my life and something that I've been able to really enjoy and grow in the Lord in. Uh, for the past five years, I have been an adjunct professor for Missouri Baptist University. So the first four years of that were in the classroom because we lived in the St. Louis area. And then, of course, when I moved here to Sedalia, it converted to online, and now I'm doing virtual teaching. 
Uh, but in five years of, of higher learning, teaching, uh, I have, I've seen a couple of consistent common themes with college students especially. And so I'm thinking primarily of about 18 to 22, 24 year olds. That's, that's the window of, of people that I normally uh, am teaching. And, and a common theme that I have found continually throughout every class as I've taught the Old Testament and the New Testament history, ev almost every single college student, at least that cares, there's some that don't, but those who are there that care, they want to know what's real. That, that is just all across the board. They want to know what's real. They want to know what is truth. Because I've noticed that a lot of them come from contexts where they are familiar with Bible stories. You talk to them about the VBS stories and the Sunday school stories, and they know that. They know about the stories, but they don't know what the stories mean. And so they want to know what is really right, what is truth, but they don't know how the Bible applies to that. Well, how do we address that? What is going on there? What's going on there, and it's not on this slide, but I would encourage you to write down these two words, biblical theology. That's really the mark of the healthy church that we're focusing on this morning. Biblical theology. Now, what is biblical theology? This is not in your notes, but again, I would encourage you to, to write this down. Biblical theology is this idea of a growing and an expanded, expanded meaning of Scripture, especially what it means to life. So it's a growing and expanding understanding of Scripture and what it means and how it applies to life. You see, it's easy for us to intellectually know a lot of things about the Bible, to know a lot of the Bible stories, but yet when it applies to our lives or what actually the meaning actually means, we're really lost. So college students want to know, for instance, and I've, I can't tell you how many times I've heard questions about uh, what does the Bible have to say about marijuana? They grew up in church. They didn't hear anything about that. Or what does the Bible have to say about living together? Does it talk about that? They grew up in church, didn't hear anything about it. Or what about getting tattoos? These are things that are real life situations that they just don't know what does the Bible say about it because there's been a breakdown somewhere of what does the Bible holistically say about life? How does it apply to every aspect of life? And then there's another aspect of biblical theology that we have pretty well failed in, and I'm speaking universally here. We, we know the stories of the Bible, but we don't know what they mean. And let me give you an example of this. I can't tell you how many times in teaching Old Testament history, we would get to a story in the Old Testament. It's this very obscure story. You maybe you've never heard of it, of it, but it's David and Goliath. You ever heard of that story? And, and so we would talk about David and Goliath, and I would ask him, what does the story mean? We all know what happens in the story. And they would say, well, you know, we're supposed to be courageous, right? We're supposed to be strong, determined at the various giants in our life. So don't give up. Keep working. Keep pursuing. Have you ever heard it explained that way? That's not what's going on with David and Goliath. The point of that story is not for us to become strong and determined in the faith. That's in Scripture, that's a part of Scripture, but that's not David and Goliath. Biblical theology helps us see, and hopefully at the end of this sermon you'll be able to see this, biblical theology of understanding Scripture helps us to see that the story of David and Goliath is about foreshadowing a future son of David who's not going to just defeat a big bad guy named Goliath. He is going to defeat the worst giant of human existence, that's sin and death. And so he didn't use little stones, he used a wooden cross. And his life was sacrificed to destroy death for you. That's what David and Goliath is all about. You're not David, Jesus is, right? Biblical theology helps us understand what is the meaning of these things. And so you can see on the sermon slide where we're going with this. I'm, I'm wanting to show you my hand. When we understand scripture rightly of how it applies to life and its meaning, you and I can come to no other conclusion than it's all about God. Now, that sounds like a very simplistic statement. It kind of is, but we're going to show why and how it is all about God. So if you're taking notes, this is your big idea. Kind of everything is under this umbrella of thought, and that is a healthy church holds to sound biblical theology 
of God as the essence of Scripture. Long statement, but a healthy church, again, that's what we're talking about. What are the marks of this, of a healthy church look like? Holds to sound. It's not tainted with with wrong uh, thinking. Sound biblical theology of God. It's focused around God, and it's at the essence or the foundation or the center of Scripture. And we're going to see this from Luke chapter 24. Let me set the context here because we're jumping into the middle of this story. You might be familiar with the Emmaus Road experience. So here in Luke 24, Jesus has just been resurrected. So the first uh, 12 verses are about the resurrection. But there's a problem going on here. Only the women have seen Jesus alive, but none of the disciples have. And so two disciples, not of the original 12, but two followers of Jesus, they leave Jerusalem and they are on a road to Emmaus. It's about a seven-mile journey. And they're walking along the road, talking amongst themselves about what just took place over the course of the past three days. Jesus was executed on the cross. He was buried. And now they've just heard a report that they can't uh, validate and Peter couldn't validate that Jesus is no longer dead. So they're walking, they're talking, and somebody joins them. A third person joins them. You and I know that it's Jesus, but they don't know that it's Jesus. They think he's just another weary traveler. And so they're walking together, and unbeknownst to them, Jesus, he asks them, what are you talking about? And they say, do you not know what's just happened? And they explain everything that took place, that Jesus, their Messiah, was killed. Everything seems to be lost. There's been reports of him being resurrected, but they don't know. And if you read through the first 25 verses, especially from verse 13 to verse 24, there's a lot of doubt. There's a lot of sadness. There's a lot of sorrow. There's a lot of uncertainty. Is Jesus really what he said he would be? That takes us into our text. In verse 25, Jesus begins to speak for the very first time, or at least he explains to them a few things. And what he says is deeply significant, and what it results in is deeply significant as well. So this is Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 25. And he, that's Jesus, he said to them, these two travelers, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Verse 27. Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, Jesus explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. And they approached the village where they were going, and they acted as though, and he acted as though he were going farther. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it is getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and breaking it, he began giving it to them. Pay close attention to verse 31. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. So they said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? And they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the 11, the 11 disciples, and those who were with them saying, the Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon they began to relate their experience on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. Okay, the first main point, we're going to have two. The first main point is the tools of biblical theology, the tools of biblical theology. This is one of my more favorite, I have a lot of favorite stories in the Bible, but this is definitely up there. I really enjoy this story because it has so much in it. On one hand, you have this anxious uncertainty You have this rebuke from a savior. You have this wonderful revelation and then joy of excitement of the victory in that revelation. But in the middle of this story, almost smack dab in the middle is verses 25, 26, and 27. And that's really what we're going to be focusing a lot of our time on here this morning. Because here in verses 25, 26, and 27, Jesus is teaching us biblical theology. In other words, Jesus is teaching us how do you understand Scripture so that you see Christ and then its meaning to all of life. Okay, so that's what Jesus is going to do, and then we'll see in a little bit the results of these tools. So let me give you five tools here in this story, especially verses 25, 26, and 27, five tools of biblical theology bearing in mind that a healthy, biblically-minded church applies this individually and corporately. We know Scripture by how Jesus teaches us to understand Scripture. 
first tool of biblical theology is this. Biblical theology follows God's pursuit of the heart in redemptive history. Biblical theology follows God's pursuit of the heart, and and here, kind of showing my hand, that's all throughout Scripture. God pursues the hearts of his people, and he does that in redemptive or salvation history, his way of saving people throughout their history. Look at verse 25 of Luke 24. It starts in what we might say is not the most encouraging way, right? Right? Uh, Jesus starts talking to these weary travelers, which, by the way, you and I should very much resonate with because basically their biggest problem is they don't understand the meaning of Scripture. That's what they're struggling with. And if you've ever had that same realization, you're in the same boat. Look at what Jesus says to those who don't understand Scripture. He says, oh, foolish men and slow of heart. So they're, they're not doing what they ought to do. And notice how he brings it to their heart, their seat of their humanity. Slow of heart to do what? To believe in all the prophets have spoken. Now, this should be shocking to us, understanding the context of Luke 24. It should be shocking to us that Jesus doesn't rebuke them for not trusting that that he's resurrected. He's not talking about, why aren't you believing the women's report that I'm resurrected? Don't you know what the Bible says? He doesn't address the resurrection What he does is he rebukes their heart's posture to Scripture. See that? He doesn't say the resurrection. He points to the Old Testament, and he says that you have not believed the testimony or the the teaching of the Old Testament. And these have some significant trials and significant things that are going to happen. To put it very simply, he's exposing that they have head knowledge, but you know where I'm going with this. They have head knowledge of God, but not heart knowledge. They know intellectually things about God and things about what the Old Testament has said, but it hasn't so moved into their heart that they believe what they cannot see. That's the essence of faith, by the way, believing which you cannot see. They don't have this, and because they've missed a heart understanding of Scripture in primarily the Old Testament, but we could expand it to the New Testament, they have missed what biblical theology teaches us, that God is always coming after his people. If you want to think of the New Testament parable of the the 99 sheep that the shepherd leaves to go after the one, that's God pursuing his people. He pursues our hearts because he's not interested in just an intellectual understanding of him. That's vital. You need to intellectually know God, but he's interested in your heart knowledge of him. So I've done a lot of premarital counseling before, and I love doing that type of counseling because most of the time, everybody's pretty happy to be there, right? Everybody's pretty excited because they want to get married and they're looking forward of what's to come. And, And I like to do this. We talk about, look, you know each other intellectually, right? You know things about one another. You know preferences and desires. But in your relationship before marriage and especially in marriage, you need to have a heart understanding of one another. You need to know who is this person, not just some details about them that anyone could know, but I need to know who is this person that I'm marrying. And then I like to pivot at that point and say, you know, that's what it has to be with God. That we need to know the attributes of God, which we're going to talk about at the end of the month at Sunday Night Theology. We'll talk about the attributes of God. You need to know the things about God, but you can't stop there. You have to know heart understanding, the essence of God, because when your heart is so captivated by God, guess what happens? You're drawn in intimate relationship with God, like any good marriage, right? So that's, what, that's really what we're seeing here in verse 25. Jesus is exposing they've missed it. Not only just the resurrection, they've missed the point of Scripture up until this point. They've missed that God pursues the hearts of his people for salvation and bringing them to himself. So let me ask a question of application here at this point, if I may, and ask this question to yourself. This is meant to be something that we consider in our own hearts. Does Scripture draw my heart to Christ? In a moment, we're going to see in the fifth tool that everything is about Jesus. Everything in Scripture points to Jesus. And so before we get there, we need to say, when you read Scripture, is it drawing your affections and your desires towards Christ? Because that's what it's meant to do. God is pursuing your heart through his word, 
for salvation, not only to become a child, but to grow in being a child. So I want to know, you need to know, does scripture do that in your life? Do, are you more, are you drawn closer to the Lord when scripture speaks and when you read it? Scripture ought to draw you to the Lord because biblical theology, our understanding of scripture must help us see God is pursuing us, our hearts, and he is doing that in redemptive history. There's a second tool of biblical theology, and that is that biblical theology follows the unity throughout scripture. Biblical theology follows the unity throughout scripture. If you were a part of last week's Sunday night theology, and thank you so much for those of you who attended. I know I went over time uh, I went a little bit longer than what I would said, uh, what I'd said I would do, but you stuck with it so well, and I'm so thankful that you did. We talked about Scripture, about how all of Scripture goes together, and we talked about the necessity of Scripture. We talked about the infallibility and the inspiration, uh, inerrancy, the necessity and sufficiency. All of these things about Scripture we talked about, and here we have to say, if all of that is true. If this is all from God, there is unity in the word of God so that all of God's word goes together without fail. There is no aspect of the word of God that is outside of what the rest of scripture is saying. It all works together cohesively. So Jesus says this in verse 25, doesn't he? After rebuking them that their hearts are slow to believe, again, notice that he doesn't say the resurrection, but he says very specifically, all the prophets have spoken. So at the very least, what Jesus is doing is he's saying in the 16 Old Testament prophetic books, there's unity, there's cohesion. But Jesus doesn't just stop there, does he? Look at verse 27. He says, then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he then shows how it points to him. So now not only it's the prophets, but it's the writings of Moses, okay? So he's expanding in the Old Testament, but he doesn't even stop there. Luke lets us know one more time, lest we think that anything falls outside of this unity of Scripture. Look at verses 44 and 45. Jesus has now appeared, resurrected to the disciples in Jerusalem, and this is what we're told. Verse 44 of Luke 24. Now, Jesus said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with them, that all things which are written about me, now hear this, in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. That's it, right? That's scripture. That's the Jewish text before the, the New Testament was written. So what Jesus is saying is all of scripture is cohesively together in the same theme. The theme that he's going to say, it's fulfilled in me, is what he's saying. And we'll get to that here in a moment. But we have to see that there's unity in the word of God. And let me just give you this nugget that I want you to go home and chew on, which you wouldn't chew on a nugget of gold, but just, just hear it and, and think about it, okay? There's unity within Scripture because there's unity in the personhood of the Trinity. And that's, that's a huge thing to understand, especially in counseling and understanding how we are to relate to one another. There's unity in the Word of God because there's unity in the personhood of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Which, by the way, can we then back this out? And this is, again, a, a, this would be another sermon that I will eventually preach if there's unity in the Trinity, in God himself, one God, three persons, if there's unity then in the words of God, guess what? There must be unity in the children, in the people, in the body of God, body of Christ, his people, believers. So unity comes from truth of God's word because it comes from the unity of God himself. Does that make sense? So there's a, there's a, there's a line here that we have to be following, that unity of God's word comes from God. We have to see that all of scripture holds together because it comes from the Lord. The prophets, the law of Moses, the Psalms, and everything that has come from the Lord. Third tool of biblical theology, not only unity of, of uh, scripture, not only God's redemptive work of pursuing our hearts, Third tool is biblical theology believes what God says about God. Number three and number four are going to be very close to one another. I'll let you know that already. But notice what we're told in verse 26. It's obvious that they did not understand what God had said about himself in Jesus Christ. And Jesus makes that clear when he says, verse 26, was it not necessary for the Christ, that's another word for the Messiah, for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter into the Father's glory. Now, here's what you have to understand. When we, are, when we are reading scripture, we have to understand the context, not only of what's going on around it and the, and the words and the sentences and the chapters 
but the historical context. Here in the first century, we have to understand that no Jew was expecting a suffering servant Messiah. No one. When they talked about the Messiah, they were thinking of a kingly Messiah, right? They were looking for a victorious Messiah. They were looking for someone who was going to free them from the bondage of the Roman Empire over them. That's very clear because when Jesus dies, what do they do? They don't go praise and worship him. They go hiding because they didn't think that Jesus was going to die. They thought he was going to reign victorious and they were going to reign with him. No one had an understanding that the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior was going to die to accomplish the messianic work. And that's very clear here. I think that we could even put it this way, and I'm going to make an application in a moment. Bill talk what I'm about to say. In a sense, the Jews in the first century imported what they thought of God rather than listening to what God said about himself. They imported what they wanted God to do and who they wanted God to be rather than what God said about himself. And because they did that, I'm going to show you how much they missed of the Old Testament. In verse 26, I am convinced Jesus had Isaiah 53 in his mind. Isaiah 53 is the gospel of the Old Testament, as some have called it. Listen to the suffering Messiah language in uh, four or five verses here. Isaiah 53, 3, listen to this. Speaking of a future Messiah, he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. That's suffering. Verse four, surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. God was saying that he himself through Jesus would bear the grief and sorrows of man, of his children. Verse five, But this suffering servant was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Verse 7, he was oppressed. He was afflicted. Verse 10, but the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. You cannot read the Old Testament, especially passages like Isaiah 53, and miss what God said about himself. He was going to suffer because there was something greater going on. But the Jews missed it completely. They missed passages like Psalm 122, verses 1 and 2, where it says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you recognize that? Jesus said that on the cross. He was thinking of Psalm 122. Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I have no rest. The only time Jesus could say that from Psalm 122 was on the cross. The only time that he had sinned and paying the penalty of sin, our sin. Hebrews 2.10 picks this up in the New Testament. It was fitting for him, speaking of Jesus, for whom are all things and through whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. Sufferings gets to glory. That's the idea of what Jesus was saying in Luke uh, 24, verse 26. And then one final passage, 1 Peter 1, 10 and 11, as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating, hear this, as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories yet to follow. If the Jews had understood, if these travelers had understood what God had said about himself, they wouldn't be depressed and worried and concerned on the Emmaus Road. They might not have fully understood it, but they would have had faith that God's in control. So friends, hear this statement and then I'm going to apply it. Trust what God says about himself in Scripture. Trust what God says about himself in Scripture. You and I will always fall off the boat when we follow after more what we perceive and think God is rather than what God has said of himself. Now, you might not struggle. We probably don't struggle with what the Jews did of a suffering Messiah because we know the story of Jesus. We know the story of the cross. That's not something that we struggle with. But perhaps for some of us, myself certainly included, is it possible that we have built up a God in our minds that we think God's greatest desire, maybe we would never say it, but we live this way, God wants me to be happy, right? So when something happens in my life, 
that doesn't make me happy. Where's God? That's functionally saying God wants me to be happy. Maybe some of us have built up a God in our own lives that God just wants to give me my heart's desire. In a very small way, that's true only if we're desiring him. (laughs) But otherwise, God's not going to give you your heart's desire. He's going to change your desires to his son so that you desire the desires of your heart, which is Jesus. Do you see how we get in trouble? We're just like the Jews of the first century. When we create a God and in our minds so that we stop listening to what God has said of himself and instead think that God is something else. Biblical theology says, no, 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 friends. It's not about our perception of what we think, but it's about what God has said, which leads to the fourth Um, tool of biblical theology. It's very similar. It goes hand in hand with what we just said. Biblical theology focuses on what God said instead of what we think. It's more significant. What has God said? That is certain. That is objective. There is no change in the divine and in the divine words of God. There are changes in how I think of God. There are changes in my perception of things. There is uncertainty in my mind. There's no uncertainty with God. Are you hearing that biblical theology keeps us focused on what certainly matters most? And it's not what I think about God. It's what God has said of himself and now my life. Does that make sense? Biblical theology focuses us on God first and foremost. And then I want to go quickly to this fifth and final tool of biblical theology because this is really the thrust of the passage. Fifth tool of biblical theology, not only that it's focusing on God and what God has said rather than what we think, unity of scripture and redemptive history through God pursuing our hearts, but fifthly, the biblical theology sees scripture ultimately focused on Christ. Biblical theology sees scripture ultimately focused on Christ. I would encourage you to turn your attention to verse 27. After Jesus has lovingly rebuked these weary travelers, and he could do the same to us because we're so like them, what does he do? He doesn't leave them in a state of uncertainty. Verse 27, then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he goes throughout the Old Testament, he gives them biblical theology. He explained to them the things concerning himself, check this, in all of the scriptures, without exception. He shows how all of it points to one place, and it's to Jesus. He is showing how he is the thrust of all of scripture. Now, let me just give a quick aside here. I am not saying, nor do I think Jesus is saying, that we need to go back into every Old Testament passage and New Testament passage and just try to fit the box of Jesus into this other box of the verse. We can get into a lot of mistakes if we say, okay, this verse has to be telling me that Jesus is Savior, so I have to try to twist it to make it say that. That's not what we're saying. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus, when he was on the Emmaus Road, he used all of Scripture to say in some way, either explicitly or implicitly. It either smacks you in the face or there's a little faint glimmer in the background of looking forward to a greater one that's to come. So when you look at David and Goliath, as I mentioned at the very beginning, yes, there is a context there that matters, but the ultimate meaning of that passage is looking forward to a greater savior than King David, who he failed. When you read uh, Daniel and the lion's den, this is another great story that we teach our kids. You should be teaching that that's pointing forward to Jesus. There's a context there, but it's ultimately pointing forward. When you read Song of Solomon and you read about the sexual intimacy in marriage, you should be seeing this being language of the relationship with God of drawing us closer together as Christ is to the church from Ephesians 5. And when you hear obscure stories in the Bible, 1 Kings 2 comes to mind. You know what 1 Kings 2 talks about? It's when the teenagers were mauled by bears because they made fun of Elijah's baldness, right? And every person who's uh, follically challenged gets really excited there, right? Not looking to anyone in specific. (laughs) That's ultimately pointing to Jesus. In some way, we're not going to try to make it something that it's not, but everything is pointing forward to Jesus. And friends, if we miss this, then we will come out saying, well, you know, I just really need a red letter Bible. I just really need to know what did Jesus say and that's it. 
You're going to miss everything Jesus said if you miss everything else in Scripture. All of it proclaims the glory of God and the greatest manifestation of the glory of God is his son, Jesus Christ. And that's on every page of scripture. Jesus is the ink that's spilled on every single one of your pages of scripture. Now, that's not just Jesus saying that. Let me show you this in a couple of other places in scripture. Acts chapter eight, you're probably familiar with this story. Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip's out in the desert. The spirit leads him there. Chariot rolls by. An Ethiopian eunuch is reading from Isaiah 53. Well, that's amazing. He's reading a really good passage. He asks, what does this mean? Uh, uh, Acts 8:35. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning from this scripture, Isaiah 53, what did he say? He preached Jesus. See that? Old Testament, it's all pointing to Jesus. What about Jesus? Did he do this anywhere else besides Luke 24? Sure, John 5. John 5, 39, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, and he says, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about whom? You can say it out loud. Me, Jesus said of himself. What about a few verses later, verse 46? Same thing. If you believed Moses, you would believe me because what did Moses do? He wrote about, Jesus said of himself. You can look at the very end of Luke 24, again in the verses we read earlier, in verses 44 and 45, Jesus explained the scriptures to the disciples by showing that he's the fulfillment of them. Herman Bovink, he was a theologian, a Dutch theologian from the 1800s. He said this, God saves by causing himself to be known and enjoyed in Christ. In the back of your bulletin, there's a quote from Peter Lilbach. He's a professor at Western Theological Seminary in, in um, Pennsylvania, and he wrote a book, Seeing Christ in All of Scripture. This is, this is what he said. Christ is the mediatorial Lord and Savior of redemptive history, not only at its end, but also from beginning to end. Thus, when we interpret the Old Testament correctly, without allegory or artificial manipulation, but in accordance with Jesus' own teaching, hear this now. The central message on every page is Christ. That does not mean that every verse taken by itself contains a hidden allusion to Christ, but that the central thrust of every passage leads us in some way to the central message of the gospel. So every time you hear a sermon proclaimed, you should hear Jesus. In some way, Jesus is every part of God's word. All of scripture, biblical theology teaches us, Everything in scripture is pointing to our redeemer. Why? Because God is pursuing you in redemptive theology, redemptive history, on complete unity of what God has said about himself so that we see Jesus. Do you know why we pray, help us to see Jesus? It's because that's what Jesus prayed in the high priestly prayer of John 17, and that's what all of scripture is about. It's all about Jesus. So let me ask a question of application before moving to the second and final point. Friends, do we see, believe, and teach scripture that focuses on Christ or ourselves? And maybe I'm making an unnecessarily, unnecessary bifurcation, but I know my own heart, and it's very easy for me to read the Bible, and my first question is to think, what does this mean for me? What does it say about me. When the first question ought to be, what does this show me of Christ? And then, how does it apply to my life? You want to know how scripture applies to your life? Find the meaning first, not of your subjective thinking, but the objective understanding of Jesus that will explode with meaning and application into our lives. That's the tools of biblical theology well, the rest of our text, I will quickly go through in the second main point, which is the results of biblical theology. And I don't want to go too quickly on this first one because this is where I think everything culminates. When you have a right understanding of Scripture, what are the results? We're given two of them in verses 28 to 35. Two results, and this first one is so important. Two results of biblical theology. The first one is this. Sound biblical theology opens eyes to Christ. There is 
a rich imagery of what's going on in verses 28 down to about uh, 30, 31 or so. It's near the end of the day. They get to Emmaus and their destination. They invite Jesus in. Jesus agrees, he acquiesces, and he stays with them. They share a meal, and notice what happens. In verse 30, Jesus does what? He takes the bread, and he breaks it. Now, that should be screaming into our minds the Last Supper, right? The last Passover from just a few chapters previously. But not only that, that should be screaming into our mind the Lord's Supper that we partake in, right? Notice what happens when the body of Jesus is broken, the imagery of this. Notice what happens in verse 31. Jesus breaks the bread, reminding us of the Lord's Supper. Their eyes were opened and they recognized Jesus. When you and I partake, we're not doing the Lord's Supper today, but when you and I partake of the Lord's Supper, it should be opening our eyes to Jesus, his body put to death on the cross, his blood that washes away our sins. And friends, this is what we mean. When you hear the words of your Savior and when you see the cross of Jesus Christ, his body broken for your sins, you cannot help but see Jesus and your eyes are opened to understand who Jesus is and what he's done for you. Friends, I I don't know, but I have to ask, have you seen Jesus? I have to ask, if you're watching online, have you seen Jesus? Because when you see the words of God all across his word, when you hear these truths that you have been made a child of God, your eyes are open to Jesus and the things of this life, they really start to fade away. That's not just holy speaking, that's reality for the Christian. Our life is so open to Jesus because our eyes are full of Jesus. Do you know Jesus? I was thinking and praying at this point, Yesterday, and I was confessing sin to the Lord because I didn't want to bring any sin here, but I earnestly prayed, Lord, someone is going to be there tomorrow whose eyes need to see Jesus because they just haven't seen him. Do you know my Savior? Do you know what he's done for you? Not just head knowledge. Do you have heart knowledge? Are you in love with Jesus? Have you seen Jesus? Jesus. Sound biblical theology is what God most often uses for you and me to see Christ more. There's a second result. Not only do we see Jesus, but when we see Jesus, that leads to something else. And that sound biblical theology leads to burning ministry. Oh, friends, do you see the progression? Jesus gives them understanding in Scripture that everything is about him And then they see Jesus because of what he has done. And then when they see Jesus and their eyes are open to Jesus, there's a burning that cannot go out. Look at verse 32. In verse 32, when Jesus vanishes from their sight, they said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to them? You know that Greek word for burning? It's this idea of being set ablaze. It means being consumed by a deep fire. So if we were to put this in more common vernacular, these guys were on fire for Jesus because what do they do? They get up, it's evening, it's dark. They've just walked seven miles. They turn right back around and go another seven miles. And if you want to walk 14 miles today, And not only are they doing it, they're doing it in the dark, when it's the most dangerous time to do it. They don't care. No sense of self-concern. They are running back as fast as they can because they are going to proclaim to the people in verse 34, the Lord has really risen. When you see Jesus, the things of your finances start to pale in comparison. What somebody said about you to hurt your feelings that starts to pale in comparison. The pain of the past, 
The uncertainty of the present, the unknowing of the future pales in comparison because when you see Jesus, there's a burning within you, a yearning to go about our Father's business. Let me just ask you, are you ready to run back to Jerusalem to proclaim the gospel? If your eyes have been opened, you're getting right back on that treadmill and you're saying, I'm going because he's alive. My eyes have seen the resurrected Savior. So let me finish with three final applications. And the first of these are just very simply what we've just been talking about. Has Christ ignited my heart? Oh, friends, you can fool me. You can fool your family member. You can fool the people who sit in pews around you. You cannot fuel, fuel, uh, fool, cannot fool, I've been talking about fire, so I'm thinking of fuel, cannot fool the eternal judge. Has Christ ignited your heart? If so, let me tell you what that will look like. You can't get enough of him. You can't. You won't be perfect. You won't get everything right, but you want to learn. You want to grow. You want to know this Jesus even more. Has Christ ignited my heart? Second application. What do I hope to get out of church? I'm asking you to understand yourself. Understand yourself here. What are you hoping to get when you come here? What is motivating you? As a church, we are committed to sound biblical theology, which means we want to ask the hard questions and we want to give the hard answers as we understand from Scripture. We want this to be a place where you come with your brokenness, where you come with your uncertainty, where you come with what does this mean for my life? And we say this is what God's word has said. Not what I think, not what we think, but what God's word has said. May he be glorified and might we see Christ through that. What do you hope to get out of church? Then finally, who has God placed in my life for me to proclaim the risen Savior? Friends, biblical theology is not an end to itself. It is the main tool of understanding God's word so we see Christ, so that we might help others see Christ. Where is your Jerusalem that you need to run to right now? Who, are, who is gathered in that room that those two they ran back to proclaim the resurrected Savior. God's placed people in your life, and you might be the only one in their lives who know Jesus and proclaim the gospel. Who has God placed in your life to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ? Friends, I don't know where you're at, but I feel especially called this morning to say, if you do not know Jesus, do not rest until you are right with your Savior until you've received this grace of redemption that washes away the weight of your sin and gives you freedom in Jesus Christ. If you don't know the Savior, you can. You can. It's right here through the conviction of God's word, through his word, so you might see Jesus, repent of your sins, ask for forgiveness, and believe that Jesus Christ did indeed save you and give you new life in him. No matter who you are, let's see Jesus. Let's follow Jesus and burn with obedience as we follow our Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Well, Lord, once again, as I come to an end of a sermon, I just am so amazed that there's so much more that could be said about your truth. May we never get over the truth of your word and what it means and how it applies to our lives. So, Father, I just ask for your grace upon grace upon grace to the saints gathered here today that we might know you, see you, and follow you. And for those who are gathered, who even in this moment, there's an uncertainty in their spirit, a disquieting that is sent from your spirit to them and, and they, their sin is before them. Father, I just pray that your spirit will continue to convict that their sin will grieve them and that they will know that the only hope for them for their eternal destiny is Jesus Christ repenting of sin and believing in this so great a Savior. Father, I just pray that none of us will rest until we are right with you, that we might seek to follow you, that we might speak of you, and we might love you as you have called us to do. Lord, thank you for your truth, and thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Our song of reflection is Jesus is Lord of all. And this is what I said in the first service. I'm gonna say it again. If that is true in your life, if Jesus is Lord of everything of your life, then I want you to sing really, really loudly. So much so that I want somebody else to be sitting next to you and say, wow, 
Jesus is really Lord of their life. I want us all to be singing that Jesus is the one who is leading and guiding us, and then for it to be true in our lives as we stand and as we sing our song of reflection, Jesus is Lord of all.